Panel three is about space access and tourism. A little different from what you just heard, that is the uh, living on the moon, uh, but of course, space related. First, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Kavya Manipu. Dr. Kavya Manipu is a NASA space scientist working in flight operations and training for exploration on the Artemis program on the moon at the Johnson Space Center. Prior to NASA, Dr. Manipu worked on the next generation human rated spacecraft, the CST-100 Starliner at Boeing, where she served several roles, including space suit lead, flight test director, with hands-on experience and astronaut training. She served as a mission evaluation room manager for the International Space Station. She is also an adjunct professor at the University of North Dakota School of Aerospace Sciences. Dr. Kavya holds a BS in Aerospace Engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology, MS in Aeronautics and Astronautics from MIT, and a PhD in Aerospace Sciences. She was the recipient of ASEI's Woman Engineer of the Year Award in 2013. She holds six patents and 25 international publications. Dr. Kavya is a second lieutenant of the Civil Air Patrol and serves as a VFR pilot and aerospace officer at the Ellington Squadron in Houston. She is a private pilot, scuba driver, trained in aerobatics, amateur mountaineer, and an Indian classical dancer. Wow, so much. Besides all of that, when she has some time, she enjoys educating and inspiring students to pursue careers in STEM fields. Please welcome Dr. Kavya Manipu. Thank you, Dr. Srikant, for the introduction. Just a quick calm check. Can you hear me? And if so, just give me a thumbs up. Awesome. Hello and welcome everyone to the Space Access and Tourism panel. I'm quite excited to be here today alongside our esteemed panelists. The topic, Space Access and Tourism. Uh, as we know in the recent years, access to space has become increasingly sought after for scientific, technological and economic growth. And not only in the United States, but globally. And much more recently, in fact, within the last year, we have seen through the various flights conducted by SpaceX, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, there has also been an interest by the public for space tourism. It has become therefore imperative that access to space is an enabler to broader opportunities. And while space tourism might be a small subsector of this industry, we all hope that it will really bolster the entire new space industry and positively impact many socioeconomic factors on Earth. Today, we are for this panel, we are joined by three panelists who will be shedding more light on this topic. Our first panelist is Mr. Richard French. Mr. Richard French leads business development and strategy for Rocket Labs Space Systems Division providing end-to-end -end mission services and on-orbit operations with the company's photon family of small spacecraft and high-end satellite components. Mr. Richard spent over a decade at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, where he led development of the Techstars Starburst Space Accelerator Program and managed technology partnerships with industry in the Office of Space Technology. He also spent two years on detail to NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. as a staff technologist in the Space Technology Mission Directorate, leading development of the tipping point and announcement of collaborative opportunity solicitations. He was awarded the NASA Honors Early Career Public Achievement Medal for his work as a lead mechanical systems engineer on the Soil Moisture Active Passive Mission and helping to land the Curiosity rover. Mr. Richard holds a master's degree in space systems engineering and a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering, both from the University of Michigan. Please welcome Mr. Richard French. Our second panelist is Dr. Kelly Wiener-Smith, who received her PhD in ecology 
at the University of California, Davis. She is an adjunct professor in the Biosciences Department at Rice University. Kelly studies parasites that manipulate the behavior of their hosts, and her research has been featured in the Atlantic, National Geographic, BBC World, Science and Nature. Wow. When she isn't studying nature's creepiest wonders, Dr. Kelly is writing books with her husband, Zach Wienersmith, who's the creator of Saturday Morning Breakfast Serial Comics. Their first book, Soonish, 10 Emerging Technologies That Improve and or Ruin Everything, was a New York Times bestseller. Their next book is about the future of humans in space and will be published through Penguin Press. Welcome, Dr. Kelly Wienersmith. Um, Ashley, I'm right after this panel, I'm going to go look into the book you and your husband has written and looking forward to the next book from you. And okay. finally, we are, we are graced by our third panelist, none other than Dr. David Livingston. We've heard about Dr. David Livingston earlier, and he led our panel Living on the Moon. So I'm not going to go into a detailed bio for him. However, I would say Dr. David Livingston's show, The Space Show, I've been listening to it for quite a while now and really enjoy the thorough discussions that are led on that show. So please welcome Dr. David Livingston. So it gives me really immense pleasure to welcome you all. And I'm personally excited to meet you and all that you will be sharing, us, sharing with us today. A quick overview of the format of the panel. The, the three panelists will be providing their opening remarks for five minutes each. And this will be followed by a moderated Q&A session for 30 minutes. And then finally, we'll take a few questions from the audience. With that, the floor is yours, Mr. Richard. Uh, thank you, Dr. Manyapu. Um, and it uh, looks like uh, uh, the charts are coming up. So very nice to be here today. I apologize for any background uh, noise. Hopefully that's not uh, too bothersome. Um, and, and yeah, let me know if my audio is coming in well. So um, I'll just give you a quick uh, a five minute overview of Rocket Lab and hopefully lay a good foundation for uh, the discussion that follows. So if you want to go to the next chart. Um, you know, Rocket Lab is uh, uh, is is growing into an end-to-end -end space company. I think you know this. Is, the first part of this panel is is called Access to Space, and and you know, Rocket Lab is uh, on the forefront of, 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 of that problem, the global leader in, in dedicated small launch. And of course, uh, um, with the announcement of our uh, of our neutron medium lift launch vehicle. So I'll talk a little bit about both of those things. But I also um, hope to give you a sense of of how we're growing and how a, a company that has solved the access to space problem, can build on that platform uh, to move up the value chain and um, really become an end-to-end -end space company with spacecraft, spacecraft components, and end-to-end -end mission services. Uh, next chart. So uh, this gives you a little bit of an overview of the company. So we are a global uh, um, corporation uh, listed on the NASDAQ uh, with our headquarters in California, but we've got a global footprint. Um, with offices in Albuquerque, Denver, um, on the East Coast, with Launch Complex 2, our uh, Planetary Systems Corporation in Maryland, uh, Sinclair uh, Interplanetary in Toronto, and then all of the uh, uh, ass uh, assets that we have in New Zealand, including our awesome production complex and uh, our propulsion test complex and our launch complex one, which is one of the most capable launch sites uh, in the world. So I'll give you a little bit more details on those as we go. Uh, next chart. So I, I hopefully fo folks uh, know um, Electron. Uh, this is uh, um, the industry leading dedicated small launch vehicle. We've deployed, uh, it's hard to keep track sometimes because the, the launches are becoming so frequent. So I apologize if some of these statistics are not uh, really up to date, but um, uh, you know, 20, uh, you know, over 20 launches, over 100 satellites deployed. Um, really an interesting uh, technology. This is a, a fully carbon composite launch vehicle. It's the first one we know of that actually is operational. Um, and, uh, and so that's a, a, 
one of our core technologies that we're uh, experts in, in uh, cryogenic uh, composite uh, structures and, and pressure vessels. Um, uh, but this uh, uh, this rocket has some other innovations. Um, uh, we call it Electron because it's actually battery powered. It uses uh, electric pump driven rocket engines, um, which is a, another innovation uh, that Rocket Lab led. Um, and those uh, rocket engines, of course, are fully additively manufactured. So, you know, a lot of the buzzwords that you hear um, uh, today from companies getting started, you know, are, uh, are, are operational across our vehicle. And next year. And then if you follow uh, our announcements, then, then you'll know that we're working on uh, the next step uh, to solve access to space, which is a medium lift launch vehicle. So think about um, a Delta II replacement, uh, which is designed for uh, constellation deployment, national security, and will be um, certified uh, or certifiable for human space flight. Um, uh, happy to answer more questions about this. Uh, and it's a, it's a LOX. Uh, uh, methane system, um, again, uh, leveraging our carbon composites. Uh, and, uh, but the thing that we really like to talk about with this vehicle is that from day one, it's being uh, built to be reusable. So it has a return to launch site capability that we hope will, will uh, make this a very uh, reliable and cost-effective uh, vehicle. Sorry. So, uh, you know, access to space is, of course, um, uh, uh, it's really critical to have the infrastructure. So the, the rocket itself is, is one element, um, uh, but the, uh, uh, the launch infrastructure is, is another. And we're very uh, um, thankful uh, and, and, uh, to be able to have one of the only privately owned and operated launch sites in the world. Um, it's also one of the most capable can access from 30 degrees up to about 110 degrees launch inclination. Um, and, uh, um, and it can operate uh, as many as 120 launches uh, a year. And so that's a launch every three days out of our, our New Zealand launch site. Um, this year, you'll also see our second launch site, uh, Launch Complex 2 in Virginia, uh, become operational on the first launches. Um, and so if you're on the eastern uh, the shore uh, of the US, then um, look out for launches coming to Virginia. Right. So I'll, uh, I'll kind of conclude with a couple of comments about our, our space systems division. Um, we're, we're moving up the value chain with our family of small spacecraft called Photon. Um, don't think of this as a, a standard bus. Uh, think of it as a, uh, as a, a family of spacecraft. We really like to solve hard problems with the missions that we do. And so we're vertically integrating with key capabilities, um, uh, uh, many of uh, which are being acquired through uh, acquisition and ver being vertically integrated. Um, uh, and, uh, and hopefully with the missions that I'll highlight in a second, give you a sense of the hard problems that we're trying to solve. Next right. I'll, I'll note our spacecraft components business because one of the things that we really pride ourselves on is being a good ecosystem partner. So uh, while we are vertically integrated, we think that's very important for controlling quality, schedule, and cost. We want to be a good ecosystem partner. And so all the capabilities that we're vertically integrated, we also offer as a component capability, um, basically as a merchant supplier. So anyone that wants to come to us, um, we're very happy to enable their uh, spacecraft and space capabilities um, and uh, as we do our best to, to, to be a good ecosystem partner. And this is actually a great business to be in as well. Next chart. So I'll just conclude with a summary of our current missions. We have two spacecraft flying today over on the left. You can see First Light and Pathstone, both of which are in, on orbit and happy and healthy. Um, we're preparing for our capstone launch um, early this year, uh, heading to the moon. Uh, we're kind of in a, a race with, the SL, with Artemis 1 to see who will be the first launch of the Artemis program. So we're very hopeful that, that we'll be the first launch uh, to send a spacecraft to, uh, back to the moon as part of Artemis. Um, we've got some great missions going with NASA, including two spacecraft going to Mars with the Escapade uh, mission, um, the LOXAT-1 mission, which will demonstrate cryogenic fluid management uh, um, uh, technologies. Uh, this will be very important for future on-orbit transportation architectures. Um, we've got a commercial mission with Varda Space Industries, where they're developing in-space manufacturing technologies. And there's an entry probe that will actually come back to Earth with finished goods. 
Um, we're doing a mission to Venus, uh, actually a privately funded mission to Venus. It's a, it's a science mission uh, searching for life, uh, again, using a small entry probe. And then finally, we're doing mission operations for the methane sat uh, sa uh, satellite, which is a um, very high impact uh, uh, program, which is seeking to reduce uh, methane emissions. So, um, you know, a year ago, I, I think a lot of uh, folks wouldn't uh, have known that Rocket Lab was working on, on so many um, spacecraft and, and space systems capabilities, but it really gives you a sense of what you can do building on, on access to space capabilities. So I think I'd probably use up my five minutes, so I'll, I'll conclude there and, and appreciate your attention. Thank you so much, Mr. Richard, for shedding light on what uh, Rocket Lab has been doing to provide access to space. This has been a great overview. Next up is Dr. Kelly Wienersmith. Hi. So I don't have any slides, uh, but I'm going to jump right in. So first, I'd like to thank the organizers for having me be part of this uh, interesting panel with such a such great other folks uh, to chat about such an interesting topic. So uh, as was mentioned, my husband and I are working on this book about the future of space settlements. And the sort of premise of the book is that we might finally be at the point where the cost of sending stuff to space is low enough that we can actually start to make some of our space settlement dreams a reality. And people have been saying this for decades, but we think it's actually true now. And that's quite exciting. And so part of our book is about the hurdles that still need to be overcome to make this happen, include, including things that we don't know about how the human body responds to the space environment. Uh, and generally, we're asking the question, have we really thought this all the way through? And so how did I end up on a panel about space tourism? Well, we've read lots of books and papers by space advocates, and a theme that you see over and over again is that tourism is going to be an important thing that will sort of pave the path to creating space settlements. And so the idea here is that creating like small hotels will give us experience with building habitats in these extreme environments. Uh, and for example, you know, the sub suborbital and orbital tourism will support companies that are working on making rockets cheap and reusable. And if companies can make that, you know, a reality and can drive the prices down low enough, then we might finally be able to build settlements, which are going to require tons tons and tons and tons of supplies to keep humans alive for a really long time. So that's all super exciting. I'm excited about thinking about uh, the more distant future of space tourism. So for example, you could imagine a rotating space station in low Earth orbit. And there would be some pretty big benefits to having uh, a hotel in low Earth orbit. So first of all, if it was rotating, you could minimize some of the negative impacts about on the, uh, for example, on bones and muscles that were sort of hinted at in the last panel. Uh, additionally, if it's in low Earth orbit, you get some of the protection from the Van Allen belts and from Earth, so space radiation effects can be minimized a little bit. And the idea here is that if you build a small rotating hotel, then that will give you the experience with trying to figure out how to make this difficult engineering challenge a reality, and then you can scale up from a hotel to a community, which is going to be a much bigger challenge, a much bigger structure. You can also imagine hotels on the moon or Mars. I think the moon hotels are probably a more realistic near-term possibility, uh, mostly because people envision their vacations are gonna take weeks and not years. Uh, but the idea here is sort of the same, that you get experience building this hotel, and then you can scale up and build a community. And then perhaps, you know, the people who work in the restaurant at the hotel might want to settle there forever eventually. And if that's biologically possible, a settlement might, you know, sort of pop up around this hotel. And there are some really interesting risks that tourists will be taking, especially early on. So some of those risks are really straightforward. So for example, if something goes wrong with your rocket or your habitat depressurizes, that's a risk that's easy to explain and easy to understand. But there are some risks that are more unclear because the science is unclear. So, you know, as the last panel discussed, radiation is a very real problem. Most of the data that we have on how radiation impacts human bodies is from the International Space Station and the astronauts that reside on it. Those astronauts are protected by the Van Allen belt. So we actually have very little data aside from the two weeks, you know, the two week trips that the Apollo astronauts took to the moon. We have very little data on how radiation in space impacts the human body. So there's some unknowns. There's additionally unknowns, you know, related to how babies will do if they're conceived and they develop in a space environment. 
I was at a National Space Society uh, workshop a couple, maybe a month or so ago, and the biology working group was saying that maybe we're going to need to create artificial wombs because it might never be safe enough for a pregnant woman to be walking around a space station that might always be too bad for the, for, for the baby that's developing. So we might have to have artificial wombs that you can clad in radiation protection and you can keep the baby safe that way. Uh, so that might create some interesting liability paperwork that tourists will have to fill out. Uh, another thing that I think could be a problem for space tourism is that a lot of people have a vision of habitats in space that might not be very, that might not match up well with the reality. So for example, if you watch movies about space or you even look at National Space Society uh, like ad material, the habitats have these like amazing glass ceilings and they have these huge spacious areas. And you know, most of the habitat designs that I've seen are you pile one to three meters of regolith on top of the habitat. And so you're not, you know, looking out at the heavens at night, you have an experience that's maybe a bit more like a mole living underground. And you might not want to have these huge open air uh, areas where everybody's under the same space, because if you get, you know, a micrometeorite that punctures the habitat, then everybody has a bad day. Whereas if you have lots of small habitats that are connected by airlocks, then a very small number of people will have a bad day. So I think there's a really interesting engineering and design challenge for architects uh, to design habitats that are still beautiful, even if they're not beautiful in the way that, you know, most people might envision going in. So uh, I think nobody really knows how space tourism is going to inter interface with space settlements, but I, you know, hope to see that starting in my lifetime and I'm excited to be here to chat about it with everyone. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Wiener Smith. And that was great. Actually, one thing that struck me, uh, what you said in the beginning was, have we really thought through this in its entirety? Let's hold that thought. Uh, I'll probably we'll, we can discuss more about it. Uh, next is Dr. Livingston. Can't wait to hear your opening remarks. Uh, thank you. And uh, it's good to be part of this panel. Um, since this is about tourism and space access, let me first address a few words about space access. We need low cost, routine space access. I do believe we're moving in that direction, but we're not there. So here's how you can tell when we get there, and then I'll move on to space tourism. You will no longer get alerts on your phones or your equipment that this company or that company is gonna launch something because we don't get alerts when the airlines are taking off and flying. You know, we, we may get an alert if an accident happens or, you know, some passenger smacks a stewardess or something, but you don't get alerts to routine flight operations. You want low cost routine flights into space, which we need, especially the cislunar route. We're not gonna hear about it. Why won't we hear about it? because they're routine and they don't make the news anymore. So pay attention when your alerts cease, when SpaceX quits bombarding you that they're about to launch this Starlink or that one, or ULA or Ariane quits sending out a message or space.com says quit, doesn't send you out a link to their website showing this or that launch before or something like that, you know we will have routine and low cost space access. So for space tourism, it's a long time coming. I started the space show 20 years ago, thinking that space tourism was right around the corner. It was a major part of my dissertation. And back in the late nineties, it was orbital space tourism. Suborbital was not even conceived of. And the only reason it got conceived of is because almost all the orbital companies failed and they didn't want to go out of business so they regrouped and they started coming up with the ideas that we could take rocket plane or x or do this or that and turn it into a suborbital space business uh, because after all we've done suborbital both the ussr and the united states had done suborbital flights uh, in the early days of space history it took 20 years to actually 25 years probably from when i started getting involved in it to see these flights start in 2021. So um, I'm much more interested in orbital and destination tourism than I am in suborbital. Uh, suborbital 
to me doesn't seem like it's worth the cost or the risk, but uh, everybody will have their own preference on that. But the price has to come down. So when we were talking about uh, space tourism after the X Prize was won, uh, Virgin and the other competitors, as to the degree that there were other competitors, were talking about two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand dollars per seat, and they were talking about well, the price will eventually come down to a typical adventure travel uh, experience for people. So I don't know what Blue is charging for the paying passengers, but on the last flight when the financiers were on that flight, the reports were $28 million per seat. So that's hardly 300,000. And that's a long, long way for coming down to being affordable to um, even an adventure travel person. And again, I don't know the actual commercial prices uh, SpaceX on their flights, uh, look at what it costs for Inspiration4 and what they bid, uh, you know, to, I mean, it, of course, it supported a, a nonprofit institution, so it's a little bit of distortion from commercial markets. But I guess I would say we are a long way from space tourism being an, an everyday business if we just look at price, whether it be suborbital or whether we look at orbital how long and how many flights it's going to take to reduce prices, I can't tell you, but that's something that we all should pay attention to. The lower that price goes and the faster it drops, uh, the closer we are to uh, true commercial space tourism. Now, I think Kelly did a great job in talking about challenges and risk. Uh, like her, I think space tourism may be a feeder into space settlement but space settlement needs to be its own separate industry and not be 100% dependent upon space tourism. Uh, but initially, there'll be a symbiotic relationship there that uh, is gonna be very, very important. And um, the other thing that surprised me, maybe I was caught really unaware, was the naysayer movement that has surfaced because of the suborbital flights and because of the SpaceX Inspiration4 flight, where the billionaires are being criticized for spending the money on what they want to spend their money on uh, and, it, and how bad it is for environments. They don't mention that SpaceX is experimenting with green fuel, which would totally get away with some of the problems of launching a large number of rockets. I, I'm sure others are doing the same kind of thing. Uh, I was at a conference in San Antonio um, on um, rapid response for the military uh, to get a platoon of troops anywhere in the world using suborbital vehicles in an emergency basis within six hours. And one of the speakers was a fuel company in Florida that five years ago, six years ago, was making and testing green rocket fuels. So that's never mentioned by the, by the naysayers. Um, but to the degree that this could possibly be a growing movement, uh, I would say space tourism folks cannot be willy nilly and just dismiss it. Uh, I think that the challenges that are posed by these people um, need to be answered. And I don't think the space community does a good job of answering naysayer questions. So I did two late night, all night CNN shows after two of those space tourism things. And 100% of the interviews were about naysayers and criticizing how Bezos spends his money. And um, I mean, I, you know, I, I answered it and smiled, but uh, then they asked me back and it was the same thing for the next flight. So are they listening? I don't know. There's a couple of other things we need to pay attention to with space tourism. Right now, there is an ongoing moratorium on regulation. There are a lot of voices calling for space tourism to be regulated by the government. The current moratorium ends October 1st, 2023. There is absolutely no indication one way or another if the moratorium is gonna be renewed or if the industry is going to be regulated. And if so, how it will be regulated 
and what that regulation will look like. And there are participants on both sides of that argument that are lobbying really, really fiercely for their position. And I think this is really important because space tourism, while it is now a, a commercial industry, there is no more giggle factor about it like there was 15, 20 years ago. It is still not commercial to the degree that it can stand on its own. Uh, it, it doesn't have realistic pricing, even for suborbital trips. And um, it's still a big, unique thing. I mean, when Blue goes to launch their new Shepard, you know, it's a six hour TV show. Uh, and then two more hours or three more hours interviewing everybody when they come back. That's not an industry that can stand on its own two feet yet. So if it gets regulated October 1st, 2023, what do those regulations look like and how will they evolve? I think that's crucial. If it stays with the moratorium, what does that do to the naysayer arguments? Because they're out there calling for the industry to finally be regulated. And what does that impact on policymakers? And trust me, it does. It impacts people that get elected to Congress and it impacts people involved in policy. So these are some things we, we really need to look at. Um, there are a couple of other uh, things I could tell you to look for, uh, but um, the big one out there is, does anybody have an accident? And uh, what does that do to the emerging space tourism industry? So um, when NASA has had an accident, it shuts down the shuttle, it shuts down the whole flight industry. So were SpaceX to have an accident, does it only shut down SpaceX or does it impact uh, Virgin and does it impact Blue and vice versa? These are questions that we don't know. Now, hopefully nobody will have an accident. Nobody's out there cheering that on, but keep in mind that uh, Virgin has been delayed uh, because of structural issues with their craft uh, and they're uh, having time to sort of go through and repair and get back on track. So I don't know what the latest is because I don't follow it very closely. But the last time I heard is that Virgin was going to be delayed in resuming flights until later on in 2022. So uh, the accident is a wild card. And um, I, I don't think these companies can take anything for granted. They have to be as diligent on their third, fourth, sixth, 10th, 15th flight as they were on their first, because as soon as they get uh, a little bit lazy, they take a shortcut, they're gonna have an accident. And that will really impact the industry, although I'm not wise enough to tell you how it's gonna impact the industry. Um, so that, that's what I would say. I'm excited as can be that the, it's finally taking off. I mean, I didn't think it would take 20 years. I, I was surprised it took this long, and, uh, but I'm glad it's here. Uh, and um, I'd like to see Blue Origin run their space tourism business more as a business rather than as a novelty. And uh, I would like to see Blue Origin in general run their rocket building division more as a business rather than a novelty. But I don't have any influence there. Uh, I would like to see SpaceX find a way to devote resources and more time to Dragon tourism flights, orbital flights, even if there's no destination, have a three, a three orbit flight around the earth or a five orbit flight around the earth or something like that. With the onslaught of private space stations being developed, maybe in five to eight years, we'll have destinations. And I, I think that's more likely than destinations on the lunar surface for a while. So I think it's an opportunistic industry. It's primed for commercial growth but we need to have our eyes open and the people doing it need to be attentive to every single detail or they're going to cause damage for um, lots and lots of people and possibly for the industry itself. Um, and thank you again for allowing me uh, this time to talk about one of my favorite topics. Thank you very much, Dr. Livingston. Uh, thank you for your insights. A lot of the questions that still prevail in space tourism, um, you brought up those, and I think it's imperative that we discuss those. 
So uh, we'll move on to the next part of our session. I will be posing uh, questions to the panel and panelists, please feel free to jump in and answer them as you see fit. I wanna take a step back and look at the big picture. You all have almost touched on this, but let's let's go back and look at look at the big picture. Why do you think space access and space tourism is important? And how does it actually fuel space exploration? Do you want us to just jump in or? Sure, um, any of you uh, can jump in and answer or we can go down the line. Um, well, to me, um, the, the path to um, peace in a better world goes through space. So when we were fighting the Cold War, we were making treaties with the USR, USSR to rescue our astronauts. We did uh, Apollo Soyuz test mission while our Cold War was pretty hot as a Cold War with, uh, with uh, us and the USSR. Um, there is an enormous amount of benefit coming uh, out of space for our everyday lives. And uh, I don't know how many people listening have been in an emergency room or an intensive care unit and um, see the equipment that they're using. Almost all of that is space derived equipment. Uh, if you get picked up in an ambulance and they're communicating with a hospital or a care center X number of miles away, and the ambulance is driving like hell to get you there. How do you think they're doing those communications? Uh, re remember, we can monitor what an astronaut does 300 miles above us wirelessly, you know, and, and have as good a health monitoring as if you're laying in the bed in, a, in an ICU bed. So space is for everybody, even if you can't go there, even if your country doesn't launch rockets, it is for everybody because we all benefit from it. And um, as far as research, uh, I, my family is the benefit of um, crystal protein growth experiments uh, using the space shuttle many, many years ago. Uh, and I don't want to get too far into it, but it allowed molecules of a certain disease to float apart in um, microgravity and um, when they were able to return the experiments, scientists could look at the structure like they've never been able to look at, even with an electron microscope. And 15, 20 years later, there are genetic medications for this disease that are giving people normal lives. So uh, people that say we can't spend all this money, it's a waste, they don't know what they're talking about. First of all, the money is spent here on Earth. It's not spent on the bank of the moon or, or the interstellar bank of who knows what. It's spent all right here on Earth. And these results, these experiments, they go around the world at the speed of light. They're not kept by the scientists that discovered what was what on that particular liquid crystal, crystal protein growth experiment. Everybody benefits from it. Um, but I could go on, and it, you know, it would be easy to fill up the entire time, but we need access, we need low cost access, we need scientists from all over the world to be able to benefit in this and humanitarians. And damn it, we cooperate with people in space, we don't fight with them. And the efforts to come up with norms of rules of norms for uh, to not do ASAT demos like was just done. Um, most of the nations are working to achieve those results. Uh, the rogue nations don't want to do that, but I, I think numbers and um, the benefits of uh, this, and we could get into a lot more detail, but I just don't think it's necessary. It's the pathway for how we should be living in a developed world and how we have to be living in a developed world and how we have to take care of ourselves and uh, who knows where the next innovation is gonna come from or what nation or what scientist. So we can't shut down the opportunity. We have to expand access. And I believe that op opportunity will arise and, takes care of, and take care of itself as long as we uh, have an opportunistic culture where you can make investments, you can fail, 
you can take risk and you can kind of choose what you're going to go and research and uh and then let's bring the products to market and benefit everybody that's how i would answer your question thank you dr livingston that's actually a great segue to my next question um regarding opportunities uh, this is uh, for Dr. Wiener Smith. In your research, as you're writing your book, what do you see as opportunities for space tourism? Uh, do, do you mean like uh, like where do I think it's most likely going to happen, or or what things do I think it will unlock? What what things do you think it unlocks? And actually, this probably ties into what you mentioned earlier. Like, have we thought about it in its entirety? Uh, could you uh, throw some light on 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 this based on sure your so i'm Sure. So, uh, you know, in, in terms of space tourism, I, I think that, you know, if, if we can end up getting, for example, you know, rotating space stations, which are either part hotel, part lab, uh, you know, part research station for, you know, the USA or Russia or something like that, uh, you know, we, we get the opportunity to collect a lot more data. And so the more people you have in space under different sorts of conditions, the more opportunities we have to sort of understand how, you know, for example, if you're in a rotating space station, how much does it have to rotate before you can sort of ameliorate some of the problems that we have associated with microgravity? So for example, uh, loss of vision, or I think it's near, I can't remember if it's near-term or far-term vision, but uh, one of those types of vision tends to go down in astronauts who have spent a lot of time in space. And so we think that maybe one of the causes of that is fluid shifts in a no gravity environment. So do you have to be rotating a space station at 1G to to get rid of that problem entirely, or does rotating at 1.6 G solve that problem? And so, you know, if space tourism can be a way to just get more people up there and get more data, maybe we can start figuring some of this stuff out. It's a little uncomfortable to think about people or tourists as being sort of like guinea pigs for, you know, us figuring this stuff out. But to some extent, I don't know how we start figuring these problems out without sending a lot of people out there and, and just sort of seeing what happens. And so to me, one of the, one of the great opportunities about space tourism is that you just you get more people up there under different kinds of circumstances and you can just learn more and that information helps us decide can we start settlements or can't we and sort of what what roadblocks still exist for humans to spend a lot of time in space what kind of medications do we still need what kind of countermeasures are still necessary uh and you know we, we still have a lot to learn thank you dr wiener smith uh, Mr. Richard, you are a business leader. We just talked about various opportunities. And actually, I'm curious to hear about your thoughts um, on the way we think about diversifying business beyond access to space. Sure, yeah, I alluded to some of that earlier. And, and I, maybe I can tie it in with some of, of, of David's uh, thoughts as well about kind of the value of space and, and um, you know, geopolitics. Uh, um, I mean, you know, uh, and even though this is a topic about about you know tourism, which is obviously a crude exercise, um, you know I, I think real, you know, robots are are a really important focus. Um, you know we're involved in a number of science missions, and we think that science missions are not only a good business to be in, but but really inspirational. Um, and so when 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 we can uh, expand the opportunity for young scientists and um, you know a broader set of industry and university partners to to engage in space science missions, um, you know that, that that really raises the boat for you know that really raises all boats. Um, there's you know, a lot of people out there that I think in the in the, the broader world that look at what the United States does and what NASA does in particular, and and they're inspired. They they think it's altruistic that. You know, we would launch a, uh, you know, and fund the giant consortium to build a, you know, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, you know, a ten billion dollar investment in expanding, uh, uh, you know, our knowledge of the cosmos. You know, two small satellites that still, um, you know, can do uh, um, decadal class science. And so we think that you know, companies like Rocket Lab and um, you know, have a great opportunity to contrib contribute to um, you know, uh, robotic missions. 
um, that that will also uh, you know build up the ecosystem and make space tourism and other crude exercises you know, more more achievable um, and uh, and more regular. And I, I guess the example that I'll offer is you know the communications and navigation infrastructure at the moon is is pretty rudimentary right now. There's, there's, it's very hard to get data back from the moon today. We think that small spacecraft and, and robotic capabilities uh, based on commercial implementations have a big role to play in, in filling that, uh, that gap. Go ahead, uh, yeah. Dr. AJ. Yeah, hi, uh, uh, question for Richard, actually. Um, uh, it's you know I've been following your uh, Rocket Labs uh, progress and it's really very quite impressive, really very heartwarming actually, <laughs> very good. Um, and now this this new neut neutron rocket that you have, and all uh, and maybe something even you know bigger than that uh, hopefully, but at least with the neutron rocket you are um, giving uh, a competition to SpaceX. Um, for a reusable rocket, you know, which is really the one that is able to go to orbit, which, you know, as David said, is just the important, important thing. So uh, what you have any, can, do you have any um, plans of, uh, and I'm very glad about that, but do you have any plans of, you know, competing? And, and this competition really is absolutely needed. And we were hoping to get that from Blue Origin and Bezos, and it didn't hasn't come through, and so I, I I'm very elated to see what you guys are doing. So, any other plans to go beyond that, or uh, you know, anything else? Sure. Well, I, I mean, maybe I can just you know talk a little bit about Neutron. You know, it's Neutron is a is a Delta II class vehicle, um, and you know when Delta II stopped flying, you know that really left a big hole in the market for that size vehicle. Um, uh, and so we, we think that's a really um, great opportunity for us. Um, and uh, but but we're not going to stop flying Electron. You know, you know, Electron is serving a really important role right now. We're seeing huge demand for Electron, and so. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, are we going to compete? Absolutely, we're going to compete. I mean, the, you know, the, we're, 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 as David mentioned, I mean, we're still very capacity limited. You know, we're, you know, every launch is a, is a, is a major webcast event for every company. And, and so, um, you know, to me, it's, it's really about execution. You know, uh, we've shown that we can execute with Electron. We're showing that we can execute on space systems. You know, we, we, you know, we plan to, to make fire this year with, with Neutron, with the Archimedes engine. Uh, and um, and you know we need to be hitting our milestones. There, there's a lot of work to do to get to an operational vehicle of that uh, of that um, size, uh, but we think we're up to the challenge. And um, and uh, absolutely, you know that we're we're in this business to compete and and, and to win. So uh, really, you know, appreciate your interest and, and support of the company, and um, you know we'll, uh, um, we're going to do the best that we can. Thank you. So uh, I want to move on to questions related to challenges and limitations. Ashley, some of you did address this. I, I do have a question and uh, Dr. Wienersmith or Dr. Livingston, um, you may be able to provide uh, some, some of your opinions on this. What do you think is the impact of space tourism on the environment? I, I'll just uh, say real quick, I, I, I think Dr. Livingston knows a lot more about research on green fuels and stuff than, than I've been, than I, than I know. Uh, I'm interested in the effect of space tourism on the space environment. There's already a lot of orbital debris up there. We'll want to make sure that the people who are starting space hotels are doing it in a way that is uh, you know, carefully managing the space environment. They, you know, dispose of their trash in good ways. When the hotel is done, they make sure they dispose of that in a, an appropriate way. So, you know, as, as we get more and more stuff up there, there might be more and more problems. So managing the space environment carefully will be important. Uh, but now I will cede the floor to David to talk about fuels or whatever. Um, so um, right now, Space tourism probably doesn't have any effect on the environment other than in the minds of people who want to believe it has an effect on the environment. 
<laughs> so world, worldwide, including the military, maybe in 2021, which was a pretty good year for launching rockets, there was maybe 110 launches worldwide, including the military. Um, so um, that's not very many launches. So there, there simply isn't much of an effect. Uh, the bigger effect is airplanes and a big component of airplane or all the people screaming and crying and yelling about how bad all this is. And then they fly to the conferences in big private jets that spew out more CO2 crap than all of the rockets do collectively in a year. However, if the space industry really started launching hundreds or thousands of rockets for tourism or other purposes, and the fuels were not modified, yeah, I, you could have a potential problem there, but they are working to come up with different fuels that do not harm the environment. And I don't see any reason why that wouldn't happen. Sir Richard Branson, who is big on all of this, has flown uh, his Virgin Air, Airlines jets as an experiment with green non-polluting fuels over short duration flights. And the planes performed fine and none of them went down and, and their fuel economy was okay. So that's not the name of the game yet. And, um, you know, electric planes for any long flight dur duration are not here yet, but then you've got to deal with charging the batteries and some other issues like that. Uh, I, so I just don't see space tourism anytime in the near future as having really any environmental impact. Now, if a rocket were to blow up on the pad, there will be an environmental impact in the blast debris area, but it will not be permanent. And, uh, you know, depending on the size of the rocket and what it blew up with, uh, that could be pretty devastating. And this is one of the reasons why uh, SpaceX is delayed by the FAA on getting a permit in Boca Chica, Texas to launch Starship because they're looking at what happens in an accident with life forms, and I'm not talking about humans, but animal and plant life in the Boca area, sea life, and the debris field if a starship were to blow up, among with other issues there on the environmental uh, impact report. But right now we're okay, but um, if no changes are made and our launch volume significantly rises, well, yeah, then I guess we could be having a problem due to rocket launches, not specifically space tourism launches, but all rocket launches combined. But I personally don't see technology in launching rockets staying where it is today. And so I think that this is a specious argument. And uh, un unless somebody can produce real facts, um, uh, then uh, I, I don't think it's something that we need to be concerned about unless we can't get away from the status quo. And I, I don't see that happening. And I might just add that, I mean, even if we can't get away from the status quo, I mean, you know, rocket engine technology is pretty slow to evolve, right? So yeah, I'm optimistic that, that we can come up with, uh, you know, um, less, you know, but the fact of the matter is we're burning hydrocarbons, right? Like that, that's kind of the foundational technology here. But even if we can't evolve the, the fuel types, I mean, I, I think we have to um, all have some technological optimism, right? Like, like there's a lot of climate change, you know, related problems that we need to solve as a society. And, um, and to your point about naysayers, like, you know, we, ho hopefully people have some level of optimism. Like if we can build a James Webb Space Telescope, then we can figure out how to do carbon sequestration. We can, you know, figure, you know, we can put systems of system solutions into place that will, will have, you know, net, net positive benefits. So, and I think that's another reason why the space program, whether it's robotic or whether it's, um, you know, whether it's crude is so important. It shows that we're, we, we're, we can achieve these things. And so, um, so yeah, I think even if the technology stays right where it is and, and it hockey sticks, just like we all want it to, I'm, I'm still optimistic that, that there's, that there's you know, mitigations. Well, Richard, what do you think about the launch rate? How high would it have to get to globally to really make a difference on the environment? 
I, you know, I've actually never looked at those numbers. I mean, I've, I've looked at like, you know, the numbers of how much, you know, cement manufacturing produces and it's, and it's, you know, out, you know, crazy high amount of, of, uh, of, of emissions, you know, from, uh, and that's why, you know, people like Bill Gates are investing in technologies that will solve, you know, different aspects of emissions problems. Um, you know, I mean, the methane zap program that we're working on, you know, it, its level one requirement is to reduce methane emissions. It's not to characterize, it's not to make maps, it's literally to reduce emissions. And so it's this really transformative, ambitious level one requirement. And so here's this one satellite that's going to try to change the world. Now, I don't know if they're going to succeed, but it's really inspirational to, to be able to work on it. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting calculation. Maybe, maybe you've already done it and you can tell us what the answer is. But I agree. No, I think it would, have to be a very, it would have to be a big number. A big number. I've not done it. So maybe Kelly has it in her book. Nope, nope. We don't deal with the Earth-based problem so much. 14 uh, percent. <laughs> Uh, greenhouse gas emission from from all transportation industry, all transportation, 14%. Of that, 2.4% is from airplane. And rockets is even much smaller, in a smaller number than that. Right. Very small. This is for GHG, greenhouse gases. Thank you. Th thank you very much for those insights. That was uh, very helpful to learn um, about, about that. Uh, so we are actually running out of time. I have one last question before uh, going into closing. I'm not sure if we have enough time to take uh, audience questions yet. So uh, Dr. Lal mentioned this uh, when she was talking about, uh, about the Artemis program. And I would like to pose the same from the space tourism standpoint. How do you think space tourism might contribute to international collaboration in space and what steps need to be taken? Dr. Livingston, do you have any uh, thoughts about this? Well, it is international because people from all over the world want to fly. So uh, right now there's two companies that are operating flights, Blue and SpaceX, um, when, when they do an orbital flight, their trip to the moon is with the Japanese entrepreneur that's taking uh, all the capsules, passengers up uh, as part of the artist community. Uh, so I, I think when people from different cultures and different nations, different countries, different backgrounds meet together, it, I think international relations and getting along on this planet uh, is bottom up driven. I, I think it's much more important at the bottom up grassroots level to cooperate with people and get along with people and want to share and be with people and mix cultures together than to think that our politicians and our diplomats and our uh, people that get to be classified as a leader when they maybe are not a leader, uh, try to do it mandated through laws and regulations on the top down. So space builds people together. So yeah, Artemis is international. More and more countries around the world are signing on to it. But Rocket Labs is New Zealand and the United States. Australia is building a launch industry and wants to be able to launch their own native rockets. Um, when um, the UAE went to Mars, they did it with Japan and the, and the US as, as active participants with them. Um, so space tourism is, is the same way. You'll, you'll be on flights with people from all over the world because as the price comes down, and I really think it will come down, it just has to come down a lot, um, that people from all over the world will, will fly. And to give you another idea, it's kind of a, a bad comparison maybe, but I'll do it anyway. There's a space burial company um, in, out of Houston and uh, it's called Celestis. And um, they're US launchers for the most part, but not always. But they're, if we can call their customers customers, but uh, uh, they have burial flights that are suborbital and orbital. They have a flight going to the moon and probably in the not too distant future, they'll have a deep space mission and, uh, and a Mars mission. They're, they're people flying, they're not people anymore, but the remains of people are from all over the world. And if you look at uh, who's 
who and what the obits are, they publish them on their website. This is, is global. And so it brings people together. I've been to two of their memorial flight uh, celebrations. That's kind of what they call them. And it's from people all over. And I'm, we're all ambassadors at that level. And we're all diplomats and we're all getting along and space is bonding us. So I think space tourism brings people together and it brings people together at the most important level, which is people to people. I mean, you don't want to fight people that you get along with, uh, regardless of what your government may tell you. Uh, so I, I'm very optimistic for our world with the space arena, which includes space tourism and commercial space. Very, very optimistic that it is going to lead the way to a better and a more harmonious world for all of us, despite what happens at the bigger international government level. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just agree that you know, anything that's based on, you know, commerce is, uh, you know, I, I've said, said it for years, you know, B2B uh, exercises are a really great way to build international collaboration. You know, we don't need state uh, department agreements for that. And, and those can happen much, much more efficiently, much more quickly, uh, um, and involve a lot more people. Um, not that I have any problem with, you know, um, uh, you know, government to government agreements. I think that we need more of those in fact. But uh, um, yeah, b business uh, has a really great opportunity to contribute to, uh, and you know, leveraging globalization for good. Uh, and uh, we're, all, we're of course also seeing, uh, you know, not for profit organizations increasingly get in, in on this, and, and that's another exciting trend. Thank, thank you so much for those thoughts. And as much as I would like to continue this hot topic and discussing on this hot topic, we may have to come to an end of the session. I haven't disappeared into space. I think it's a reminder from a computer that we are at the end of the session. Thank you so much. It's really been very interesting to listen to each of you as you shared your experiences and opinions on this growing industry. So thank you panelists for taking the time and effort to speak with our audience today and to the audience for paying attention. And as we close this session, uh, it is no doubt that more Next generation engineers will enter the space tourism sector for the scope of opportunities and innovation that would eventually decrease the barriers to entry and ultimately democratize access to space and um, space travel for everyday citizens like Dr. Livingston mentioned earlier. So stay tuned all you young engineers for exciting opportunities ahead of you. And it's really an exciting time to be working in the space industry with so many things happening. We are literally creating history. And with that, I would like to conclude this session. And to all of you who celebrate, happy Sankranti. Thank you. Thanks for moderating. <laughs>